The idea of the helicopter, allowing access to any unprepared location by flying slowly or hovering close to the ground, has long sparked the interest of the military. However, they faced even more daunting challenges than fixed-wing aircraft. The need for powerful propulsion, the difficulty of manufacturing rotors and transmission systems, and instability. Between the two world wars, numerous types of helicopters had begun to fly thanks to the enthusiasm of pioneers and advances in engines and mechanical technology in France, Germany, and the United States. Many of them were based on the so-called Autogiro invented by the Spanish inventor Juan de la Cierva. It wasn't until the Second World War that a fully functional aircraft appeared. In Germany, the FA-223, an enlarged derivative of the FA-61, made satisfactory demonstrations in 1943 in the presence of Hitler, transporting loads in mountainous terrain. This was followed by an order for 30 units, with orders given in late 1944 to ramp up production to a monthly rate of 400. At the time of the German collapse, only nine had flown, six of which were lost to bombing raids. The Allied side, especially the United States, had also been manufacturing various prototypes for some time. As for Arthur Young, he achieved satisfactory results with his models particularly due to a stabilizer bar system that mitigated the inherent instability of helicopters during vertical flight. In this way, he managed to attract the attention of aircraft manufacturer Lawrence Bell in 1941. Bell welcomed Young's small team into his company and wisely granted them considerable autonomy. It was thus that, in June 1945, the prototype of an aircraft emerged, destined to become, under the name Bell 47, one of the greatest achievements in the helicopter industry. Robust, economical, and easy to maintain, this two-seater equipped the majority of Western world armies for many years. The Second World War ended in the United States with technically viable helicopters, but without the necessary employment doctrines to make them a weapon. It seems that the first reflections on the military use of these aircraft were attributed to the United States Marine Corps. The Corps had been responsible for defining methods and means of amphibious operations since the 1920s, successfully realized during World War II in the Pacific and Europe. However, the advent of the atomic bomb rendered such warfare, reliant on large concentrations of forces, highly vulnerable. The helicopter, with its speed and flexibility of intervention, was seen as the solution for vertical envelopment maneuvers, quicker and more challenging to counter. In this regard, exercises took place from 1948 onwards, soon receiving their trial by fire in the Korean War. The Marines participated from the summer of 1951 with two helicopter units that would immediately prove their military value. The numerous missions carried out to recover downed pilots or evacuate severely wounded greatly boosted the morale of the fighters. But, above all, the helicopter offered a new way of understanding the battle. In very rugged terrain with mediocre infrastructure, it allowed commanders to have a better understanding of the situation and a closer presence to the soldier. Numerous isolated units could be resupplied with provisions and ammunition. Initially, the limited number of available helicopters and their insufficient payload capacity did not yet allow for helicopter-borne landings. But this changed with the arrival of the Sikorsky S-55 and the so-called Flying Bananas, both capable of carrying from four to eight combatants, they facilitated the execution of numerous large-scale helicopter-borne maneuvers, which could include the transportation of a battalion and its equipment. The example was followed by French forces during the conflicts in Indochina and above all in Algeria, although helicopters were still used in a limited capacity. The United States' intervention in Vietnam marked the first conflict where helicopters played a crucial role. The Pentagon took careful note of the lessons learned by the Marines in Korea, and from then on, all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces began incorporating helicopters for a wide variety of missions. In fact, 
they soon became the most visible aspect of American military presence in South Vietnam. In 1961, when President John F. Kennedy ordered increased aid to Saigon in the form of weapons and advisors, the first helicopter squadrons were deployed as part of that support. Their high mobility was seen as a significant factor in providing support to South Vietnamese troops. By the end of that year, 32 aircraft operated by 400 military personnel, including crew members and supporting ground personnel, were already involved in the fight against the Viet Cong. Three years before the first American soldiers arrived on combat missions, helicopters openly engaged the communist guerrillas. It was on January 12, 1962, during Operation Chopper. 32 aircraft transported a thousand South Vietnamese soldiers to assault a communist insurgency stronghold located 16 kilometers west of Saigon. It was a success. The Viet Cong, taken by surprise, couldn't react to the airborne assault. The success of Operation Chopper encouraged sending more aircraft to Vietnam. By December 31, 1962, the number of deployed helicopters exceeded 200. Throughout the entire American intervention, that number multiplied by 60. In addition to troop transport, heavy weaponry, and supplies, Various armed models also saw action in attack missions. The most iconic helicopter model in the Vietnam War was the Bell UH-1 Iroquois, quickly nicknamed the Huey. During the conflict, around 7,000 of them were deployed, constituting the primary means of transporting troops to operational zones. Each could carry a dozen soldiers. This aircraft remained active in U.S. forces until 2005, with its successors being the equally famous UH-60 Blackhawk. Transport Hueys were accompanied by variants armed with rocket launchers or grenade launchers, in addition to their side-mounted M60 machine guns, which escorted troops during their journey and while on the ground. Another famous attack helicopter model in Vietnam was the AH-1 Cobra, a veteran of future conflicts such as Panama or Iraq in 1991. Despite the significant defeat suffered in Vietnam, the U.S. military learned valuable lessons on how to use helicopters. The Pentagon incorporated more aircraft and developed tactics to better exploit their mobility and firepower. All this work was reflected in the extensive use of these aircraft in more recent conflicts such as Iraq and Afghanistan. Before this, in 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in support of the country's communist government, initiating a war against the Mujahideen guerrillas who were already fighting against the Afghan government. In Afghanistan, the Soviet Union's primary asset was its helicopters, in two main variants. The first was the Mi-8 HIP a twin-engine medium transport helicopter with attack capability, a design so successful that it is still in production today. In Afghanistan, it typically carried two machine guns on the side doors and sometimes one at the front, in addition to various combinations of rockets, bombs, and anti-tank missiles. Its range of 380 miles and cruising speed of 140 miles per hour were more than sufficient. It could carry a maximum of 24 equipped soldiers or up to 12 stretchers and a medic for evacuation tasks. It became the workhorse of the war for counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan. The other extensively used helicopter was the Mi-24 Hind, a specialized armored twin-engine helicopter designed for close air support, heavily armored and resistant to light weapons. It was equipped with a 12.7mm rotary machine gun and four tubes in a turret under the nose and external hard points for a combination of up to 3,000 pounds of powerful rockets, bombs, and missiles. Sometimes the third crew member, the weapons technician, carried two mounted machine guns on each side of their position to monitor the flanks. All of this coupled with its ability to withstand punishment, turned this sinister-looking aircraft into the terror of the Mujahideen, who dubbed it Shaitan Arba, Satan's chariot. In addition to its crew of three, it could transport up to eight equipped soldiers. But in Afghanistan, it was primarily used for attack. 
the extensive use of helicopters by the Soviet Union was not without problems. Anti-aircraft fire from guerrillas, especially with stingers supplied by the United States, wreaked havoc. In total, the Soviets lost 333 helicopters in the war. In the Falklands War, once again, helicopters positioned themselves as versatile aircraft, offering greater maneuverability. British helicopters played an important part in the ensuing conflict with their anti-submarine warfare equipment and their ability to attack surface ships, while other helicopters could provide close support to land forces. Probably the most important role played by the British helicopters was the provision of ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-shore transport for troops and their supplies. This included the evacuation of casualties. The Argentine army also used helicopters extensively, some being fitted with rocket launchers or machine guns, but their operations in the Falklands area were limited to transport and liaison missions. The 1990s marked the culmination of the concept of the American attack helicopter. The AH-64 Apache was extensively used during Operation Desert Storm with great success. Apaches were the first to engage in this war, destroying early warning radar sites and enemy surface-to-air missile emplacements with their Hellfire missiles. Subsequently, they were effectively employed in their two primary roles, for direct attacks against enemy armored vehicles and as aerial artillery in support of ground troops. Many enemy tanks were destroyed by Hellfire missiles and the cannons of Apache helicopters. Later, in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were successfully utilized in counterinsurgency operations. However, their use was more pronounced in Afghanistan, as in Iraq. The insurgency was primarily urban, and the effectiveness of helicopters in this environment is more limited. Currently, the invasion of Ukraine has highlighted the deficiencies of helicopters, especially attack helicopters, in modern high-intensity warfare. This conflict marks the first major conventional war since the Gulf War of 1991, and in it, helicopters have had to operate against integrated air defense networks and modern man pads, man-portable air defense systems. While Iraqi and Afghan insurgents occasionally managed to shoot down coalition helicopters, it was a rare occurrence. Coalition helicopter pilots learned to anticipate these threats. In extreme circumstances, pilots simply had to accelerate to exit threat areas or fly higher to enter a safe airspace. These tactics have not proven effective in Ukraine. In the face of more sophisticated and widespread air defense systems, helicopters are more vulnerable than ever before. This underscores the need for constant innovation and adaptation in military aviation to address evolving threats in modern warfare. Perhaps the biggest surprise of the war in Ukraine has been the threat posed to helicopters by conventional artillery. During the Battle of Hostomol, the swift bombardment of the airport by Ukrainian artillery made it impossible for Russian helicopters or fixed-wing aircraft to fly in follow-up waves behind the troops. Ukrainian artillery observers and drone operators kept the airport under continuous surveillance throughout the Russian occupation. Whenever a helicopter appeared near the airport, a barrage of projectiles would rain down upon it. There was never a moment when Russian helicopter pilots felt safe to operate within this deadly zone. In the conflict in Ukraine, a key problem for helicopter pilots is the large number and density of man pads, man portable air defense systems, on the battlefield. This means that helicopter pilots had few opportunities to evade missiles or to use terrain to protect themselves from threats. In short, if they avoided one missile threat, they encountered another. There was no escape. Unlike Iraq or Afghanistan, there is no airspace free over Ukraine. For this reason, it is not surprising that whenever a helicopter is filmed over Ukraine, it appears to be flying just 10 meters above the ground. Despite these challenges, it does not seem that traditional weapon systems in general and helicopters in particular have had their last word in modern warfare. Their evolution from now on will be key.